Dude, we are going to energize the country. Stop Brexit. No more Mr. Nice Guy. Another future is possible, but we've got to fight for it. Order. Hello and welcome to the debated podcast. As always, I'm your host, Will. And in this episode, I'm delighted to be joined by a renowned journalist and filmmaker, Oz Katterji, who is also uh, the host of a great podcast that you should definitely check out if you haven't already, Corbynism, the Postmortem. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me on. Um, so the first question uh, that I'd like to ask is, what uh, first made you interested in doing a podcast on Corbyn and Corbynism? Oh, uh, that's an interesting uh, question, actually. Uh, I haven't been asked that before. I, you know, my interest in the Labour Party and Jeremy Corbyn and foreign policy um, all sort of merged together over the last few years as a, as a result of you know, ongoing current events, as it were. Uh, and... It just so happened that I was out of work at the time of uh, the election. Uh, so I had, I had a freedom to start a new project. And uh, yeah, the, the result happened as it did. And I thought, well, this is it. I've been meaning to do my own, my own sort of project, be my own boss for a while now. Uh, I've got the technical skills to do it. So I, I just sort of bit the bullet, bought a bunch of equipment and and slid into a bunch of people's DMs to see if they'd be willing to to share their thoughts with me uh, on a podcast, and, and it, it went relatively well. Um, how did you uh, choose each guest uh, for the podcast? Because, of course, each episode of the, the podcast has an overarching uh, theme. How did you decide which people to ask for uh, which specific episodes? So I, I, did, I decided the theme first, and I built an episode around people that I thought could talk around that theme. Now, obviously, I've, I've built a reputation for myself as quite a, a fierce critic of certain policies uh, that the Labour leadership had towards foreign policy specifically. Um, so my relationship with Corbyn's defenders, uh, media defenders, shall we say, isn't, isn't the best. So I, I didn't really have a... Uh, a whole host of contacts that I could rely on for people to tell me, you know, the inside scoop of what was happening uh, during the election from inside Lotto or, or to come on and, and, you know, essentially give Lotto's perspective. Uh, fortunately, we did. We got James Mills in who, who was, uh, who, who did that job for us to talk to us about what, what life was like in the leader's office. But, you know, when starting out, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of, a lot of projects similar to this have, you know, I mean, Novara Media have one, and I can assure you it's, it's different to, <laughs> to mine. You know, they come to different conclusions. But um, I definitely watched and listened to lots of Novara, lots of, um, you know, wi- wider media outlets to, to try and uh, understand uh, the perspective of, of, of Corbynites. Um, unfortunately, I didn't get as many of them on the show as I would like. Uh, the the door is still open. The offer is still open. I'd still like to talk to more. I don't think the show is over. We've had we've released twelve episodes so far, um, but uh, we were hoping to get some others. And and the door is open. So uh, I mean, there are some bids in at the moment, but we haven't had much of a response in return. So we'll see how it goes. The story is not over. Um, definitely planning on doing another update uh, following the EC, uh, EHRC, uh, conclusions on labor anti-Semitism. Um, so we'll see how that goes, but yeah, you know, it's, a, it's been a, it's been a really interesting project, uh, had a lot of really positive feedback. Um, so hopefully, uh, hopefully we did a good job of it and, uh, and I look forward to the next project. Um, you mentioned that obviously you're going to be doing, um, uh, more episodes and obviously one focusing on the uh, result of the EHRC, um, report. Um, now, um, I think you mentioned in the most recent episode that uh, the very first episode of your um, podcast was cited in uh, a leaked uh, dossier uh, relating to anti-Semitism. Um, when you saw that, how did it make you feel? That's an interesting one. I mean, uh, I suppose I suppose some people listening to this might be surprised, but I mean, I, I just took a very you know kind of cold journalistic view of it that my work is a is a piece of work that can be cited in academia it can be cited in you know it's not just 
the random thoughts of someone on Twitter. It, it's the collection of uh, experienced, educated voices sharing their, you know, firsthand, uh, often firsthand direct experience of a, a, a series of major political events over the last few years. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I suppose I didn't, I didn't see anything, you know, kind of too weird about it being cited. I, what I found ironic was the, the fact that they, they listened to however much of it to find, you know, one thing that they could say, you know, in their, in their defense. I mean, the whole episode sort of tears apart the notion that Labour's, the Labour leadership weren't somehow involved in, uh, in the processes that, that, that are being questioned now by the EHRC. Uh, so for them to choose the sort of innocuous quote that Adam uh, starts with when he says uh, that the conspiracy theories were started uh, by the actions of the old Labour guards in the uh, in Southside, mm. who were trying to stop people from joining the party to vote for Jeremy Corbyn, the people that voted Green or whatever. That that's the bit that they they chose. But I mean, he they, he then goes on to say a lot more, including <laughs> that a senior Jeremy Corbyn staffer personally said he was personally. They believed he was an anti-Semite in a conversation with um, with Adam. So, you know, it's amazing that that line didn't get cited. So uh, it's just, just beggar's belief, really. But, yeah, how did I feel about it? Um, you know, in a, in a sense, proud that I'd put something out there that even even the Labour Party were taking seriously and listening to. It, was, uh, it sort of puts paid to any ideas that this was... Um, you know, motivated by my criticisms of Jeremy Corbyn rather than motivated by uh, trying to create a honest uh, interpretation and appraisal of the events of the last few years. You mentioned, obviously, uh, your, your criticisms of Corbyn, and I know that a lot of people have responded negatively, particularly on, on Twitter, to you uh, because you have um, put these criticisms out there. When you were um, doing the podcast, and particularly when you started the podcast, did that at all make you apprehensive thinking about the um, backlash that you were potentially going to get from certain people online? Uh, to be honest with you, there's been, you know, the, the podcast hasn't been widely attacked online from what I've seen. Um, I, I think the quality of the guests speak for themselves. I mean, it's not just members of the, of the, you know, new labor establishment that were on the show. There were, you know, we, we had uh, people from across the spectrum. We had people uh, who were personally impacted by, by these issues. Um, so I, I don't, you know, I, I think it's easier for them to attack me than it is for them to attack the work. So was I, was I, I mean, no, I, I, don't, I don't get intimidated or, 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 or worried or put off about uh, doing any of my work by the reaction I think it's going to receive from people who, couldn't interpret it in bad faith, even if their life depended on it. So mm. it, it's not really a major, major concern for me. What the the, the sort of chattering, uh, you know, anti Oz people on Twitter say. It's just really no concern of mine anymore. Um, do you think that as uh, the Labour Party uh, changes, obviously has a, a new leader now, that we're going to be seeing? Uh, a lessening of the kind of abuse that uh, people have seen online from from Labour and members, or do you think that that's going to to carry on until uh, something else specifically uh, relating to it has has been done? You see, it's a, it, it, it's weird because you know whatever you say about militant and the eighties is that we didn't live in a information environment that we do today in twenty twenty, and uh, you know. Ship posting and cynicism existed, you know, before Corbyn. It existed on the mm. Miliband, but but a lot of the people that were involved in that didn't ever feel like they were part of the Labour project the way they did under Jeremy Corbyn. So, you know, there probably is an element of people who 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 feel like something has been robbed from them that they didn't have before, and that they're willing to fight for it. Um, I, I don't know that their values were ever. Uh, with with kind of the broader Labour Party that we can try and understand as a modern political party, but you know I'm not a Labour member and I haven't <laughs> voted Labour for a, for a long time, so it, it, you know it, it's odd now that I find myself in a position of, of of 
defending Labour and defending uh, Keir Starmer's approach to things. But I mean, I mean, I'm, I guess I'm not really going out to bat for Keir Starmer because I don't feel any partisan loyalty to him in any way. I have been uh, broadly impressed with how he's handled certain issues. I think he's a lot better with the media and understands the the kind of feeling of the nation a lot better than Corbyn or Corbynites ever did. Um, but yeah, I guess it, I guess that's that's neither here nor there really. It's just uh, these people are. I don't think that that the uh, the online space is going to suddenly detoxify because uh, Keir Starmer is in charge. I do think that the online space is going to detoxify slightly from people who identified as themselves as being uh, leadership or uh, Labour loyalists. You know, you you can't be a f off and join the Tories type of person if you're if. You can't you can't carry that line and that attitude mm. under Keir Starmer's Labour Party. So it's going to have to adapt and change. Um, you know, I expect I expect to hear more things like traitors and sellouts rather than you know go and join a different party type thing. So it, yeah, it, I think it's going to change, but I don't think it's going to become more pleasant. Put it that way. Mm. Um, now, uh, one of the uh, other things that I uh, mentioned at the start of the uh, podcast was that. Of course, you're a, a journalist who has um, worked extensively uh, covering the um, Middle East. Uh, do you think that the approach um, to the Middle East under um, Keir Starmer will be very different from Jeremy Corbyn, or do you think that there will be any similarity? What, what do you think? Well, you know, foreign policy is a very different beast to domestic policy. Right, and 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 let's concede that in domestic policy, uh, you might not show all your cards uh, because you hope to achieve more by not showing all your cards. I understand that that is an element of, of domestic policy as well. Um, I, I understand that that, that Keir Starmer uh, has to play to a crowd to talk about um, you know statues and law and order to to hope to be prime minister uh, one day. Uh, foreign policy, it, there's a lot more of that in foreign policy, and, and, and especially when you're dealing with the opposition, because we didn't get to see Corbynite foreign policy in action. Mm. We only got to see the vague statements, and we had to put together a, a, a sort of understanding of the intention from, me, from these vague statements. Now, I, I, I think I'm very capable of doing that, um, uh, but we haven't seen very much in the way of Keir Starmer uh, on these issues uh, so far. Uh, the, the big ones would be Kashmir. Mm. Um, a lot of people were angered by uh, Keir Starmer's sort of, should we say, neutral response to, to the Kashmir, saying it's a bilateral issue between uh, Pakistan and India and we want peace and it needs to be, it needs to be discussed you know, peacefully in a bilateral way. Now, I've looked on paper, and this is very, very different from... I mean, this is, this is not very, very different from the exact statements that Jeremy Corbyn made. Um, I think people just, with that issue in particular, always felt there was kind of a sense of solidarity from Jeremy Corbyn towards uh, Kashmiris mm -hmm. in a way that they haven't developed with Keir Starmer. So it sounds like he can get away with more neutral... They, they basically say it's an it's an issue for P Pakistan and India to resolve peacefully, uh, but with that lack of sort of solidarity, um, in the implicit, uh, sol expli explicit solidarity in the messaging, um, that can that can sound quite jarring to people who who are you know partisan or particularly involved in, in any side of any conflict, as it were. Now, the same accusations were and are leveled at Jeremy Corbyn when it came to, you know, Syria, as opposed to, say, Yemen. You know, it's suddenly it's all about peace and the two sides working together, whereas, you know, when it, when it comes to uh, Yemen, it's we have to stop this barbarism, etc., etc. You know, there is, a, there is a, a way he uses language about some conflicts and not others. Um, have I seen that in Keir Starmer? No, I haven't. I, 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 I've just seen a kind of neutral, uh, diplomatic 
response to, to and, and that's the, been the labor model you know for 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 decades it was the labor model under uh blair whether or not the policy matched the kind of diplomatic language about the middle east or or other conflicts abroad uh, it, it is neither here nor there in, in regards to this question as as to what do i expect Keir Starmer's foreign policy uh, to be like I haven't seen enough. I think Lisa Nandy is very impressive. Mm. Um, I think her response to annexation uh, has been has been strong. Um, I, I don't necessarily believe that it would have been a there would have been a stronger response from Emily Thornbury uh, under Jer- Jeremy Corbyn uh, still as opposition. Um, you know that they, they seem about the same. I believe this is an issue that that's quite dear to uh, Lisa Nandy's heart as uh, chair of Labour Friends for Palestine. Um, you know, question marks over Syria seem to be some of the, the, the biggest ones, and, and, and Russia. Do I think that if there was a script or type incident in the UK, that Keir Starmer and, and Nisa Nandi, uh, or, or say another gas attack in Syria, that they would start asking for cooperation with, with Russia and, and, and trying to, to work out who's the, the party, who's the guilty party by involving the likeliest suspects in, you know, bilateral discussions? That was always a very naive kind of um, approach to foreign policy. Naive is a very generous way of, of putting this. Foreign, uh, I interpreted Jeremy Corbyn's messaging on Skripal and on Syria, uh, constantly asking about uh, who bears ultimate responsibility. I found that uh, remarkably hypocritical compared to the strong response he has uh, when Israel is accused of something or when Saudi Arabia is accused of something. You know, in, in, in all of these incidents, we have enough evidence to strongly point the finger at the most likely guilty party um, in all of them. However, it, Corbyn seems to pick and choose which side of the line he shows strong emotion to, depending on whether or not they're a Western ally. Um, I don't think we're going to see with the same with Starmer or Nandi at all. Um, hopefully we see a sort of internationalist foreign policy that uh, intervenes when it needs to save human life and, and stays out of uh, affairs that, that, don't, that don't need Britain to, to wave its stick around. So, you know, it, 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 this is a very difficult topic. It's a, it's a very difficult reality that the world is facing right now. And Britain is losing its, its role in the world as a leading power. And that's been, uh, it's been in decline for many decades now. Um, so I think we have to be realistic about what kind of power we want Britain to be. Uh, and yeah, hopefully, hopefully Starmer and Nandi are, are, are building towards that. But I haven't seen enough to be able to give you a firm conclusion either way. Mm. Um, and of course, one of the um, most important uh, figures in um, the Middle East in the, the past few decades has been the United States. Um, and we're seeing the US presidential election this year. Uh, firstly, uh, what do you think uh, Trump would do in regards to uh, the Middle East if he uh, won a second term? Uh, and, and secondly, do you think that if Joe Biden uh, were to win in November, his approach would be uh, different to the one that we've seen uh, from Donald Trump? I think the, bo- the two biggest questions uh maybe three actually, I'll broaden out to three. The three biggest questions with regards to Donald Trump in the Middle East uh, for a second term, in, from my perspective, would be uh, annexation of, of occupied Palestine, which Donald Trump would surely green light, which would be an absolute disaster for the region, um, an absolute disaster. Uh, and you know, it will, it will sub- subject poor people to even more suffering. Um, and it, I don't think Joe Biden would would support that. What the the more interesting question is: What happens if annexation is green lit by Trump on the way out, and then Joe Biden inherits a Israel Palestine situation in which the U.S. establishment status quo for the past, you know, however many decades has been completely upended? Mm. Um, yeah. I, that those are those, those are question marks for for much broader topics. That that would that would have to be a uh, an hour long conversation at least in its own right. Um, but but the question mark is 
what will Donald Trump do with regards to Israel Palestine and, and, and full annexation of, of, of you know parts of the West Bank seem uh, inevitable if Trump is to if Trump is to win and Netanyahu is to continue with his the path the trajectory that he's on the second biggest question mark would be uh, Iran and sanctions the campaign of maximum pressure would continue uh, how would Joe Biden deal with the campaign of maximum pressure? Uh, would he go back to Obama's strategy, which in many ways was in a strategy of, of appeasement with Tehran to get, to get the nuclear deal out of the way uh, in, in order to say, in a sense, saying Iran's arms proliferation across the Middle East don't matter to us as much as preventing a future war based on, you know, preventing a nuclear uh, arms race? Mm. The, these are, again, these are huge, huge questions. Um, I don't think Joe Biden will roll back uh, Iran, Iran sanctions uh, immediately, but I do think there is a difference of opinion about uh, how to contain Iran um, from Donald Trump's strategy to, to Joe Biden's strategy. How much of I, do I think Donald Trump is even responsible uh, for formulating the strategy? You know, I, 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 I don't think that Donald Trump is a smart or, or credible or... or um, you know, responsible uh, figure at all, shall we say. So um, I don't know how much of, of, of this policy rests on certain members of his administration or, you know, his own personal whims. That's it, not for me to speculate. Uh, but I do think the question mark over sanctions with Iran is another big difference between um, Donald Trump and Joe Biden, how they see the region. Um, Joe Biden has... Uh, his foreign policy advisors have have given indications on on Syria and so forth in, in certain interviews, but it's still quite vague. So, you know, I don't see Donald Trump's position on 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 Syria changing wildly between two terms. The third big policy uh, question mark for the Middle East over a second Donald Trump term is is the withdrawal of troops, though, and that would have a huge impact on Syria. So, uh, how does Donald Trump see troop placement in the Middle East? Um, in his second term, when he ran his first presidential campaign on withdrawing as many troops as possible. How does his relationship with the Saudis um, grow? How does that evolve? We don't know. Again, that, that would be the third, the third question mark for me. All, all of these would have significant impact on, on the way the Middle East is, uh, is run and governed, um, especially if, if, if Trump cuts more funding to USAID and uh, to UN uh, organizations that were, you know, like UNRWA helping Palestinian refugees. So, yeah, there's a, these are huge question marks. Um, and, yeah, the, the American electorate are going to decide, again, what happens uh, in the Middle East, uh, you know, by proxy, essentially. Um, now, you mentioned Syria there. Do you think that um, the West has tacitly accepted that Assad is going to stay in place? Or do you think that we will see his removal in the future, whether it be in the near future or in the, the, the more distant future? That's a very, very difficult question. I don't know a single Syria analyst uh, that could uh, answer that, Syrian or non-Syrian. Um, no, no one really knows. Uh, for starters, it's so it's so difficult to predict the whims of a president that um, that it, you know it is so unpredictable. Uh, if, if if reports are to believed, um, after the f first chemical attack, uh, Donald Trump asked if 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 Assad could be assassinated, and his own military team swatted that that uh, that idea down. Um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> If that if that situation really happened the way it's been portrayed in in in, in the media, um, I, I don't know if if, if the president's uh, what the president's whims are and and what future developments in Syria would would res how Trump would respond to future developments in Syria. I can't predict these things. What I can predict is uh, general policy by way of looking at what's come before. Uh, what's come before. Um, certainly hasn't been an appeasement of Assad by Western states, but has been a sort of, as you would say, uh, 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 an acceptance that he has won the military conflict. But that, that acceptance came out of the fact that no 
Western countries were willing to go all in on and, and help his opponents in the opposition. You know, they, they were fighting against the modern air force and then they had Iranian backed paramilitaries during the, the fight. And then they had the Russian air force during the fight. So, you know, they were never going to win a conflict against these sorts of odds without significant military support. So I guess the, the sort of acceptance that, that Assad has won was, was pretty much made in 2013 when the West said they weren't going to intervene to stop Assad killing people. After that moment passed, I think it was, it was clear to, to Russia that they, they could change the tide of the war by coming in strongly in one, in one direction on the, on the regime side and, uh, and, and, brutally killing civilians to demoralize the opposition. Do I think policy is going to change? I think policy is pretty much going to, going to stay the same. I mean, the Caesar, the Caesar sanctions are significant and they're going to uh, put significant economic pressure on the regime. Uh, but, but pressure on the regime now will come more from the will of actors like Turkey and Iran and, and Russia than uh, and internal uh, the internal economic and political pressure rather than from the West. Could that change? Could a leader come in and say, I want uh, to do X, Y, and Z in Syria? Sure. But I've seen no evidence that that's the case. And, and uh, you know, from, a, from an internationalist progressive perspective, there is always the case to be done uh, for something to be done for human rights in Syria. But can I see any Western politician running a, a political campaign based on we need to get involved, we need to send our own troops there, we need to do... These are very difficult things. And the, the general public in, in, you know, Western liberal democracies has no desire to get involved in a military intervention in, in a brutal and bloody foreign conflict. So all of these factors considered means that I don't think there is going to be any significant political change in the Syria situation from the Western side over the next few years. How sanctions develop, uh, what happens in Iran, what happens in Iraq, um, you know, is there, a, is there a massive resurgence of ISIS one day? These factors will play uh, a role in, in, in deciding the regime's fate as much as, you know, uh, more so than, than any potential Western intervention. Mm. That, that's so unlikely at this point in time. Mm. Um, we're coming towards the end of the podcast. It's been uh, great speaking to you, Oz. Uh, and I've got one uh, final question for you. We've not mentioned it during the podcast, uh, but of course we've all been uh, suffering because of the uh, coronavirus pandemic and not uh, getting out as, as much as uh, we previously have been. Uh, there is a beginning to easing of, of lockdown, but there are still uh, restrictions. So when um, this is resolved, uh, hopefully uh, very soon. What one thing that you haven't be a, been able to do are you most looking forward to doing? Um, I think just just seeing my friends, you know, uh, there hasn't been a big gathering. You know, living in London uh, as a millennial means that, that our lives have had to be planned in advance anyway. I don't get to see my friends unless I book it in the diary, you know, six weeks away. Um, so all, all COVID has, has meant not that I've... Uh, that I've missed out on seeing my friends every week, but it's meant that my diary was entirely cleared and I had no points to, to see my friends. So I think, I think large gatherings of people where I can see everyone at the same time and, and you know, it'd be nice to hug people. I don't, I don't know when, when we're back into the, uh, the phase of normality where, where people, um, you know, can, can contact each other like that. So, um, you know, I think we all want to see a sense of uh, normality resume, but, uh, only when it's safe to do so. And, and, and I have to say that, in my opinion, the public health uh, issue is, is far, far outweighs any of my own personal, um, you know, my own personal wishes for my own life. So uh, stay at home, stay safe, protect your friends, protect your loved ones, and uh, hopefully we'll get through the rest of this, the rest of this. Uh, that's a sentiment that I, I certainly agree with, and I think uh, uh, li our listeners um, will do as well. Thank you once again for coming on the podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the podcast. Don't forget that you can subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, Podbean, 
or YouTube, you can follow us at Debated Podcast on Twitter, like us, Debated Podcast on Facebook. And if you want to email us, either about appearing or making a comment or reaction to the episode you've heard or any other episodes, then email us, thedebatedpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you for listening. I hope you listen to the next one.